Good day, and welcome to another edition of One on One with Swope Health. I am your host, Eric Wesson. Thanks so much for joining us, and we've got another great show planned for you today. My guest today is Eric Dickerson. He is the president and CEO of Urban Rangers, which works with a lot of young people. Eric, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And young people, young men. So tell us about Eric. Where were you born? I was born in Kansas City, Kansas. I uh, grew up there, went to Wyandotte High School, uh, went to the University of Kansas, uh, moved back here in the Kansas City area, started working in a nonprofit uh, about 30 years ago. So it's been a while. So this particular nonprofit? No, I'm sorry. I worked for the Boy Scouts of America for about 15 years, uh, the YMCA for about five, and then I've been here at, at URC for the last 11. Okay. So... Uh, what was one of the things that you studied in college? Uh, my degree is in personnel management. It's all about HR and those kind of things. So I was always interested in just the, I'd say the back office of how things work. Uh, and I also thought if you're in personnel, maybe you always have a job. <laughs> you know, yeah, probably maybe. will. Maybe it just depends. So is that how you got interested in the program that you have now is working with the Boy Scouts? Yeah, I, I was working for the Boy Scouts and uh, just doing that kind of work. I kind of stumbled into nonprofit. My first job out of college was with uh, BGM Industries, uh, hiring part-time cleaning staff, and I had a good friend who worked for the Boy Scouts who uh, asked me to come check it out. I was never a Boy Scout. And, and really, in nonprofit work, I'll, I always say you either get it or you don't. Mm -hmm. You know, you're getting bitten by the bug or you don't. So I was bitten by the nonprofit bug. I really enjoyed working with young people. I enjoyed trying to make sure or ensure they have a better future. And I, I've just been doing that work ever since 1993. Okay. Okay. You go to church here locally? I do. I go I go to uh, Cleveland Avenue on, on occasion. My wife and I have been looking for a new church lately. So we've been looking. Okay. Wife is from here too? No, actually she's from California. So oh, she's, really? a, she's a transplant. Okay. So we, we've been trying to get get acclimated to some different things. We really started the process as COVID was starting again, as we were getting married, doing those kind of things. And COVID kind of shut some of that stuff down. So we've been out here looking a little bit. And, you know, they're saying COVID is back. That's what I heard. I, I heard yeah. this school district somewhere in Texas that uh, shut down for a couple of weeks. So it sounds like it might be on the rise. Yeah. During the summer months, I guess, because people are breathing in each other's faces and uh, all of that kind of stuff. But, yeah, we might want to start getting those masks out again and washing them and dusting them off and getting, getting ready, ready for round two of this this epidemic. Sounds like it. So uh, you went to the dot. You from mm -hmm. the dot. I am from the dot. <laughs> One raised. So how did you? What made you decide to get into working with young males? Um, honestly, it started with just working with young people all together. I just was the Boy Scouts as, as co-ed, so it was it had uh, boys and younger ages and girls when you got to middle school and high school. Uh, I just enjoyed working with young people. I really felt like coaches and different things in my life had made a difference in, in, in who I am, so I just like to give back. Uh, my job here at the Urban Ranger Corps, I, I, an I answered an ad, honestly, that said, do you like working with urban youth? It was the weirdest ad I'd ever I'd ever come across. <laughs> so I said I do. And about six months later, uh, I had lunch with a headhunter who started talking to me about the program. I vaguely knew about it because uh, I'd seen the young boys in the neighborhood in, in different uh, uniforms. I kind of knew what it was, but I didn't know a lot about it. So uh, went through the interview process. I uh, met our, our founder, John, uh, Reverend John, Father John Wallace, rather, uh, and it's really been a, a great. Fit. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, this is the most fulfilling job I've ever had because I feel like the young men I work with remind me of myself. Uh, a lot of the young men, um, um, they're just trying to look for some guidance. And, and, and I was I was fortunate to have both my parents in my life my whole life. I just lost my dad a couple of years ago. So we work with a lot of single 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 homes, single mother homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's good to be a male influence on a lot of these young men. So that's what we try to do try to be that male influence to help young men make better choices. So what do you think the most pressing issue is when we come to uh, young males in the urban core? Most pressing, I think it's uh, dealing with anger, dealing mm -hmm. with uh, being able to have disagreements. You know, they're, they're, 
in, in our day, you could have a disagreement. You might fight a couple of times, and you decide you can't beat this guy. Next thing you know, you're 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 hanging out because right. now we're friends. Right. Because we we tested each other. We we saw that one of us is going to lick the other one, and mm -hmm. we're going to be friends now. Uh, we didn't go to guns. We didn't have those kind of violent things. I think the other thing that people don't think about is that your your whole background, your whole life. It spills into everything else. So if you're home in a bad situation with violence or, you know, even if just loud yelling and screaming, you're, that's just how you see things in life. And mm -hmm. your first your first your first response is to respond that way because that's what you're used to. Uh, so we, we try to do a lot of things, things like conflict resolution with our young men to get them to understand you can de-escalate anything. You don't have to. Uh, go to violence and doesn't have to become a violent encounter. You you can really talk your way out of most things if you're willing to talk and, and just be decent. I mean, that's the things we try to make sure. Uh, so I would say violence and dealing with your anger is probably one of the best, one of the most uh, pressing things. And secondly, I, I would say uh, education, uh, making sure mm -hmm. that young men are, are educated in a way that they're prepared for life after high school. That's big for us. We're trying to make sure these young men are, are better fathers and dads and husbands. Uh, so we're trying to give them the job skills and help them learn how to do uh, different things in their, in their lives. It's not, all the way, it's not always about going to college. It's about having a plan for your future. So each one of our young men has an individual career and academic plan that, they, that we, work, we work through quarterly to make sure they're on task to be what it is they want to be. Do you think nutrition falls into any of those categories? Are our kids in the urban core, are they eating healthy? Uh, our nutrition is high on our list. We also, uh, about five years ago, we started working with Urban Gardens here in Kansas City. Uh, you, if you see an urban garden, um, our boys have probably worked on it from the harvest to planting to pruning it. We do that all over the city. Uh, my favorite one, my favorite one to talk about that most people don't realize there's a there's a garden there is at about 50th and Paseo. There's a big house and there's crops on either side of it. Uh, we work that garden every year, uh, but I do think nutrition is important. Uh, like I said, about four or five years ago, we started working more in those kind of arenas. Uh, we started talking about food deserts with our young men. We realized a lot of our young men had never been to the city market, so we we take a trip to the city market. A couple of times a year, a summer, especially during the summer, so mm -hmm. a young man can go pick fresh fruits and vegetables and see those things. Uh, I would say that nutrition and what people are eating uh, isn't always the best. You you say um, you have dollar menus and things like that that are mm -hmm. designed for for cheap meals that people will go get. That you can spend the same money on something better uh, if you take the the time to do it. But I also think we're in a society of, of rush, rush, rush. So people are out there. If you have a mom or dad is working two jobs, the kids on two different teams, the the the, the, the what you're probably going to eat is McDonald's in a car between practices and games. Mm -hmm. So I think as a whole, as a society as a whole, I think nutrition's bad because we're so busy. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're always somewhere else. So you're always eating in cars. You're just trying to. I think a lot of times people are just trying to make do. And you know that's a great point. And when you think about it. Uh, we don't have time to eat healthy. And when we do eat healthy, is it really healthy? Right. You know, even though it might have maybe some lettuce and a tomato on it or something, and we'll think, oh, well, I ate. You that's know, my salad. kids say, hey, that's what my kids say. Well, Daddy, I had some lettuce today because I ate such and such and such. Right. But you also ate hot chips. and, and well, the hot chips are the worst. <laughs> Or they have they have zero nutritional value, but the kids love them. Right. But yeah, nutrition, and I think if you don't have enough nutritional things in your body, I think it kind of sets your fuse off a little. Absolutely. Uh, a little bit more. Okay. So how do, how do you think we got to the point where we have become, and our young men have become so violent? Is it out of frustration? Is it out of just not having the opportunities, easy access to guns? What We have to have a root cause of why our community is so violent. Man, um, I think easy access to guns is definitely one. That's mm -hmm. high on the list. Um, I think a lot of situations, um, uh, lack of some male, male mentorship in your life, I think could be a problem. 
because you you get to that point as a young man that you start as, as my mother would say feeling yourself a little bit mm-hmm. and you, and you just get to that point that maybe you are you you can you're allowed to do things at home that maybe a, a dad or a male role model wouldn't let you do and i, I also say that uh, the breakdown in neighborhoods because it's not always about the dad in the home it's a dad on the block because mm-hmm. my dad did stuff for boys from either in or eighth street because you know, Mr. Dickinson would get you. So I think that it's not always about the male in, in, a, in a home. I think it's more about male role models, whether it be churches, schools, URC, different organizations. I just think we just need to do more mentorship with young men to help them just fight through this. I mean, being a teenager is tough anyway, right? Just right. just everything in your life is changing. Your, 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 body, your body's changing, hormones change, everything's changing. But to have somebody that can walk you through that, that's been through it, I think is very beneficial. Uh, and I think the other thing that, that that people don't like to admit, I think I think TV and video, I think some of this stuff is just crazy. The things that you can see and watch in, the, in that little computer that kids walk around, we all walk around in our hands, is nuts. It's a fight on every other day. Movies are more and more violent. Uh, mm-hmm. I just think that you're desensitized to these kind of things that they don't, they don't find them scary you know I, I it's been 15 years ago so i went to my elementary school and talked about you know the scared straight and just talked about those kind of things and kids said things like my uncle said you just do your time and nobody will bother you so the, <laughs> the whole idea wow. of of wow. getting in trouble it could lead you into bigger trouble didn't seem to this is a group of sixth graders it's probably 15 years ago wow. that, that a lot of them didn't have any fear of that mm. so so I think it's it's a gumbo of things that are just creating the, the society that we live in. And, you know, uh, when they think like that, there's not a deterrent. Right. Uh, before, people would be scared to death right. uh, about it, but now it's the norm. Right. It's where you go to get your, it's, it's like being in a fraternity or something like that. Hey, I've been in prison. Oh, well, okay. Well, you cool and you this and that. It's a rite of passage. Right, right. That's the work you work. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people, a lot of people it is. And it shouldn't be like that. And one of the other things about it is, where's our churches in this process? You know, the church used to be the place that we go to to get the things that we needed. But right. now it's like some people would say the church is absent in that role. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard I've heard people say that. I, I think that there's a lot of good churches doing a lot of good things, mm-hmm. but I do think there is there is a void. I would agree. Mm-hmm. I would agree. When I was growing up, we had <clears throat> I went to St. Stephen's growing up. Okay. And then later in the Palestine at St. Stephen's, we had a drum and bugle corps. That was something that could engage young people. But St. Stephen's was in the pro in the area where the projects were. So it gave the kids that were in the project something to do. We had Christian Youth Association, basketball and football, flag football, tackle football, basketball. Wow. There was baseball. There were things that engaged young people to keep them from getting in trouble and learn to like each other and get along with each other. Now it's like it's very little that you can do. It's like everybody's in their own silo. But but I also think if you go back to the Kansas City, Missouri School District when they stopped having neighborhood neighborhood schools, you didn't necessarily know everybody in your neighborhood like like we probably all grew up with. Right. Like my, my college roommate was somebody uh, I've known him since kindergarten. We went we, every school I ever went to, we went to school together. So mm-hmm. we played sports together, we did different things together, but we we were friends, uh, not the best of friends, but we were good friends my whole life. Mm-hmm. So, so I think that that has broken down some communities that um, people don't know their neighbors like they used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're you're not allowed to talk to your neighbors like you used to. Um, you know, you, you look at the transient nature of a lot of our areas. People are here for six months and gone for six months. Right. So you never put down roots and get a chance to know your neighbors. Right. And you're you're absolutely right because all the schools that I went to in elementary school. Junior high, Southeast is the only school that's still open. All my elementary schools wow. are all closed. Chick tore it down. Missouri is mothballed. Uh, Southwest is mothballed. And wow. so it's no neighborhood schools anymore. Right. I think that's big. I think because your neighborhood schools, 
it's the hub for everything. That mm-hmm. team, you have your sports teams, everybody from your school, uh, everybody that probably go to church very right. pretty close to the school. Right. So those are things I think that are broken down neighborhoods. Right, and church even. Right. You know, Palestine, Reverend Abel built the church around the neighborhood and mm-hmm. used neighborhood people to do it. But now you have most of the people that go to uh, churches in our community uh, drive into the church. Wow. If they're not walking or they're not just driving right. down the street. They're driving right. from Lee Summit, Blue Springs, those places, Independence to come into church, and then they go back out. So it's uh, we've, we've watched uh, an interesting transition in our lifetime right. taking place. So uh, what are some of the future plans that you have? And what else do they do? Because you just mentioned they prune gardens. What else do they well, do? Well, our, our young men, basically, our, our, our program is broken into two, two seasons, if you will. We have a school year season where we do mentoring twice a month. Uh, each ranger has to do at least 20 hours of community service in that period from Let's say uh, September 1 to May 1. That, those mm-hmm. are things you have to do. Uh, we do homework assistance. We do tutoring. That's what we do during the school year. During the summer, each one of our young men has an actual job. Those jobs range from working in a garden. Uh, we have somebody that works on community service teams. We have someone, We have teams that help mow lawns here in Kansas City. So the summer is about learning how to work. The summer is a, 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 a piece of our program where our young men Work a job Monday through Thursday from seven about seven thirty to two o'clock. Fridays is our enrichment day when you get a chance to do things like conflict resolution, dress for success, um, working on your ICAP, your individual career and academic plans. What we do on Fridays, um, our normal work day starts with calisthenics. We're trying to get these boys healthy. Mm-hmm. We start our our summer program with um, a three day boot camp with a lot of hiking and push ups and calisthenics. Uh, they don't like that part, but we yeah, think it's important. Yeah, I wouldn't think that uh, was on the top of their list. <laughs> but 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 it is something that we do to try to make sure we're we're trying to get them healthy mind, body, and spirit. Uh, and, and basically, we just try to put our arms around them, help them navigate the dir- the tricky part between middle school and high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of our uh, assistant leaders are former former members of our of our of the program. So now we have three young men that are in college that all come back and work for us for the summer. So that's really what we try to do, take the best of our best and have them come back and be summer interns. So you said they work during the summer. Do they get paid? Yeah, all of our rangers get a, get a wage for what they do, absolutely. Really? Yeah. That's good. Our, our young men make about between 1200 and $1,500 a summer. That's pretty good. Yeah. Gives them something to do to get their school clothes together. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that, that, that's a big deal. We talk about that. Uh, we do money management so they know how not to blow their money. We always tell the story of the young man who bought a mini bike with his first check. It's, it's before me, but it's the story we keep telling. <laughs> he, he bought a mini bike and wrecked it. Uh, he bought it on Saturday morning, wrecked it Saturday afternoon, and his whole check was gone. Mm. <laughs> but he had a good time. Great. One wreck, totaled it. For about 10 minutes. It's about 10 minutes. His whole two-week check was gone. So, okay, so you have told them about the tennis shoe situation. Twelve hundred dollars can get them four pair of tennis shoes. Absolutely, maybe. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We also work with uh, Kevin Holmes over at Channel Forty One on the Gift of Soul to help them. Uh, right. We helped raise about a hundred thousand dollars last year for uh, URC Boys and Girls Club, well, okay, both school she, districts, okay. and, gave, and gave and gave away shoes for that. So we we, we try to be well rounded and do lots of things for our kids here in the community. Okay, tell them where URC is. URC, actually, we just moved. We were right up the street at 59th and Swope Parkway. We've now moved over to 420 West uh, 42nd Street. Uh, we were in a city-owned building that um, I think Swope and some other people are going to buy and do something with. So we're right over here in Westport, 42nd and Broadway. Okay, but URC, Urban Ranger Corps. URC. We're okay. at www.urckc.org. Okay, so uh, with the young people during the school year, you said mentoring. Mm-hmm. You have tutoring too. Mm-hmm. Yep, tutoring, mentoring, tutoring. Well, we we try to help our young men stay above a two point five GPA. If you get under that, you're required to come to come to tutoring. Okay, and that goes all the way into their senior year. Yes, our plan is to get a young man in seventh, eighth grade, and keep them, uh, hopefully throughout college. Because we do college scholarships as well. We give. 
uh, we raised about a quarter million dollars to give back to our young men to go for after, after I won't say all college because we've done uh, things that people bought the first set of tools if you're going to do construction work. So it's our Hopes and Dreams Scholarship Fund. So do you do uh, OSHA training for construction work as well? We don't. We'd like to. I, I know somebody that, did, that was just doing that recently, and it's something we'd like to get our young men involved with. Okay. And then what do you have for, you said it's basically geared for boys? It's all, it's all young men. We don't, oh, we don't have anything for young ladies. So you're going to have a spinoff here? For young ladies, we they, tr- they, tried, they tried that a few years ago. Combined, and it didn't work. That's one of the things I've always said. We could raise the money. I would, I would duplicate this program for young women because I think that they are they're fighting the same fight. And if we're out here fixing young men or helping young men, uh, we need them to be able to partner with young ladies who've had some some successes as well. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of groups out here. Austin Ambitions is doing a lot of good work. Uh, there used to be a group called Rubies. I think Rubies is still around doing some good work. So there are some great, great ladies programs out there as well. So when you think about it, what uh, percentage of young men that you have in a program are in single parent homes? Uh, it is eighty percent. Eighty percent. Eighty percent. Pretty you- sure of that. And do you know what the situation is and why the father's not there? We don't. We don't. We don't. I mean, but but a lot of them are single, single single-headed households. But but we also have a fair amount of dads that come around and do things. So I think there's some great relationships that are still helping kids be okay. But we have some absentee dads as well. Absolutely. Do you ever reach out to the dads? We do. We do a fair. We do a parent or we do a parent um, um, workshop every year that we invite moms and dads to come out to. It's designed to help them understand their children because there's things um, like 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 social media. There's a lot of parents that aren't on social media. They don't even understand how it works. I've had parents right. say they didn't realize all of the all of the stuff their kids could get to on their phone. Right. They got the internet on it. They just don't. They're not. They're just not well savvy on it. So we try to teach those kind of things. We also did a course on gun safety. We had a young man. Um, this was. 19 that uh, there was a gun being passed around a middle school through the metal detector some kind of way he got home and, and he injured himself uh, so we did a course on gun safety because um, if he'd have been in that class in that class he'd probably still be alive today because the first thing is every gun's loaded it mm-hmm. didn't have a clip in it but it was one in the chamber these kids have been passing around he's on social media playing with it and hurt himself mm-hmm. uh, so we, we try to make it um, uh, appropriate to what's going on, and that one that one I struggled with because I I didn't want to glorify guns, and, and I didn't know how people would take it, but it, it was well received because I think a lot of parents when we ask the question, how many young men have been around guns, and all these hands go up like they've seen them, they've been around them, and mm-hmm. it's like they need a little training. So that was that was something we did in our in our in our parent workshop. And it's so much different than when we were coming up. You might have had somebody with one of those. Oh, rusty thirty eights or or twenty twos that, that right, may talk about that. Right, right, absolutely. <laughs> Probably the old thirty eight in my parents' house. We won't talk about that. But you knew to leave it alone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You weren't gonna mess with At, it. You never touched it. You right. knew where it was. You knew where it was. But you know not to ever test it. And now kids are grabbing their parents' weapons and coming to school or going outside right. and playing with. Right, it. right. And it just always goes back to my thoughts of how did we get like this and where did all of this start? I, I really think, like we said earlier, I think society, I think uh, movies and TV, I think oh, yeah. it, it's glorifying these things in ways that, um, I don't know, man, You because we, we had shoot-up movies when we were kids and you just didn't think that was real. You knew it was a movie. Right, absolutely. But You didn't see any blood. Like, I, I'm a gun smoke buff. I go watch Gunsmoke and all those old cowboy movies on Saturday. They come on, yeah, watch them and, all <laughs> and they get they get shot and they hold their hand. You don't see any blood. You don't see anything. I never thought about that. And it's like boom, he shot or something goes on like that. But you now the horse. it's it's glorified. You see the bullet hit somebody, impact, and you see all of that. And people and kids are getting this on the internet. Right. That was that, that one game. I'm not gonna call its its name, but when you look at the mass shootings that are taking place, it looks like that video game. 
Wow. They put the camera on, they go through, the same thing happens in my that video game. And and my son was like doing a sample of that video game. And I'm like, I just happened to walk by and look at his PlayStation and I said, What are you doing? And he was like, I'm trying to figure out how to play this game. And I looked for like thirty seconds and I'm like, uh, no you're not and I took it and blocked it so that he doesn't have access the parents to that don't know. Game. I mean, those are the kind of things that we teach our parents. They don't know you can block these things. Oh. Or they have no idea what their kids are doing. Oh, yeah, because they the kids downstairs are in their room, the parents in the living room watching TV or on the phone as well right. and not knowing what their kids do. But I go, I check my kids' phones once a week at least, <laughs> and they're like, Daddy, why are you going through our phone? I just want to see what you're saying. I look at their text messages, and I let them know that this is not their phone. It's my phone. I just let you use it. Absolutely. And until the bill comes here in your name, <laughs> then it's your phone. But as long as the bill's coming here in my name, it's my phone. Absolutely. I'll let you use it. Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, but uh, it's just knowing that there are all those things out there on the Internet. You know, I remember when we were in school, we had encyclopedias. Right, right. We had to look words up. Right. We had to learn how to spell them to look them up. Now you can just go to your computer or your right. phone and do all and that. And find anything you want. That's the scary part. And, and that's why we really thought it was important to talk about things like we taught parents how to turn off the Internet. We taught mm -hmm. parents how to shut down phones. That If you don't want them to use the phone, because a big deal would be um, phones at night. You know, you're, you're supposed to be asleep and you're texting. We're talking mm -hmm. about to shut those down. Uh, but but that's been a battle because uh, some parents just just won't do it. They're like, oh, but they just love it. They just got to have it. I'm like, no, they don't. Mm -hmm. They don't have to have all the access to what's out there. Let them be kids. Yeah, exactly. And then by the time most parents figure out how to do it, technology has changed. And so now there's another chapter of uh, that you have to look at to learn how to keep your kids safe. Right. Absolutely. And, yeah. It's a, it's a never-ending cycle. So in the coming months to come, what would you like to let people know about what you're doing, how they can get their kids involved? Not only their kids, nephews, some kid at church, how can they get involved? The, the, the easiest thing that, well, the easiest way to get involved with us is reach out to us through our website, uh, www.urckc.org. Uh, our, our main time that we recruit are, is during the spring. So mm -hmm. we, re we re start recruiting uh, applications will probably be ready in January. They'll be due sometime in March with, to get ready for the next group of young men. So we, we'd love to have, uh, we, we're equipped to take on a whole other team. So we'd like to have a, a lot of applications this spring. Uh, upcoming, we have our annual event, our annual dinner, which is on October 26th. Uh, it's our main fundraiser at the College Basketball Experience. That's also on our website. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a way that we raise the funds to keep the program going. But also when we showcase our young men. So if anyone's interested in tickets, we have some comp tickets available. If you'd like to come out and just see what we do, I think it's a good chance for you to learn more about what URT does. So we'd love to have you come out. All right. How can they call you? Uh, you can reach me at 816-682-6098. Uh, and where are your lo office is located We're again? located at 420 West 42nd Street. Basically, the parking lot behind Snooze, which is at 42nd and Broadway. Okay. Eric, thanks so much for joining Anytime. us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate all that great information. As always, I have the greatest viewing audience in the world. Till next week, remember, tough times don't last, tough people do. Until next time, peace.